increases in anti-Semitic incidents across the country. As we're reminded, since the attack in Pittsburgh, law enforcement has disrupted over two dozen plots targeting our community and our institutions around the country. One year ago last week, we commemorated the shooting in Jersey City. A year ago next week, a deadly attack in Monsey, New York, where the Jewish community gathered to celebrate Hanukkah. A church shooting in Texas less than 18 hours later was the 14th deadly shooting in a house of worship in this country since June 2015. These events are horrific reminders of why security is critical. NSGP funding has made our community more safe and secure. It's placed electronic locks on exterior doors of Jewish community centers, cameras on synagogues, and panic buttons in school classrooms. NSGP funding is now protecting more communities in more places. Recent changes, as you'll hear over the last several years, have allowed organizations in non-urban areas to take advantage of the program. This has been critical. NSGP funding now allows for planning and training that are saving lives. Today, those funds can now be used to support planning, exercises, and training for members of our community. For organizations that couldn't support such training in the past, this can literally be the difference between life and death. Every day we work to build relationships between our community and law enforcement, and the NSGP is a component of this, fostering critical cooperation and engagement. I wanna thank at the national level, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and certainly the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA who administer the grant program. I wanna recognize the members of Congress who have supported and advocated for this program, and I wanna acknowledge the network of security directors who are working on assessments, applications, and spending the money efficiently in federations, communities, and with national partners around the country. I also want to acknowledge our partners who are joining us on the call today from the Orthodox Union, Nathan Diamond, and our good friend from Ohio, Howie Beagleman. Lastly, I want to thank our fantastic partners at the Jewish Federations for North America, without whom this grant program wouldn't exist and work collaboratively with others to include SCN and the OU to lead the charge over the years to not only create this program, but enhance it and secure greater funding. JFNA, under the leadership of Eric Fingerhut and board chair Mark Wilf, are working diligently to continue to invest in making sure this program continues and grows. And it's my pleasure that we have two phenomenal partners on the call today. You'll hear from Rob Goldberg early, later, but it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, the Senior Vice President for Public Affairs, Alana Breitman. Alana? I was a, a good citizen and muting myself, uh, but then uh, speaking over myself. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Michael. It's so great to see so many interested participants joining today uh, at this nonprofit security webinar. Michael provided a, a really interesting point to, to all of this by talking about the nonprofit security program. It was 19 years ago, just last week, that the United States Senate Committee on Government Affairs held the first bipartisan federal hearing on the local role in Homeland Security in the wake of 9-11. At that time, JFNA's Washington Office of Public Affairs engaged the committee's leadership, led by then Chairman Joe Lieberman, Lieberman of Connecticut and then ranking member Susan Collins of Maine. And so we submitted a strong statement for the hearing in order to educate Congress for the first time on the justifications and recommendations of federal assistance to address the unmet security needs of at-risk faith and community-based nonprofit organizations. And from that point onward, and in partnership with both Jewish and non-Jewish organizations alike, our very own Rob Goldberg, from whom you'll hear later, has led the efforts to establish the Federal Nonprofit Security Grant Program, which commenced in 2004. And the ongoing advocacy work, excuse me, to ensure the program's continuation and funding over the past six years. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. This federal funding is a critical component to the important work being done on the ground at dozens of federations, locally raising about $30 million per year to support their local initiatives, which in turn work with the agencies and synagogues in their communities. This public-private partnership exemplifies the best in our work, leveraging local initiatives and know-how to call for the public funding so urgently needed as we see a growth in hate crimes, unfortunately, and even more so incidents that impact our communities. Just this week, Congress is finalizing the funding level for, the, for this year's nonprofit security program, which will support the very applications that are the subject of today's webinar. We thank each and every one of you who has worked diligently to support the highest appropriation level possible and certainly hope to see it come to fruition in the coming days. And with that, 
I'm very glad to introduce um, Executive Director for Public Policy at the Orthodox Union and also my friend, Nathan Diamond. Nathan, over to you. Thank you, Anna and Gesundheit. Uh, and happy Hanukkah to all. Um, I'm very pleased to be on, the, on this webinar uh, with all of you and uh, in partnership with, uh, with SCN and our great partners at JFNA, um, who, we, who we are very proud at the OU to work with um, year in and year out on the advocacy in Washington uh, to keep, not only to keep the NSGP program going, but due to the circumstances that our communities confront growing um, in its resources. Um, and uh, to the degree that you can talk about good news um, when you're talking about a situation in which we're talking about resources for security to keep our, our communities and their institutions safe, um, we are anticipating um, some positive news literally within the next uh, hours or days as Congress races to wrap up um, its work on an omnibus appropriations bill to fund the federal government for the balance of this fiscal year, which runs for the federal government through the end of sept next September. Um, many of you are aware that uh, we, together with JFNA, um, the OU JFNA and others, have been advocating for a dramatic increase in the funding level for NSGP. Um, and uh, while we're still awaiting the legislative language to be released, we, uh, we have every reason to believe from the senators and house members with whom we have worked um, that there's going to be a dramatically uh, increased level of funding uh, for this program. Um, as you will hear from uh, my great partner in this advocacy, Rob Goldberg at JFNA, and you will also hear from, from Patrick and the others, um, that's gonna mean uh, the starting gun is gonna sound very soon uh, for all of you to uh, get the applications in. Uh, again, they're gonna walk through the details of that, but um, you know, those of you who've worked on, in this area or tried to secure these grants in the past uh, know that it's been a moving target as to what time of year the funding has been finalized by Congress, which then triggers uh, the application process because it depends on when Congress can come to agreement on these appropriations bills. And, um, and indeed everything though seems on track for the omnibus appropriations bills to get wrapped up. Um, if not before the weekend, shortly, shortly thereafter as, uh, as, as members of Congress want to close up shop and go home for, uh, for the end of December holidays. Um, we, uh, we, will, we at the OU and I'm sure JFNA as well, will be alerting you all as soon as, um, the details are released. Um, it will be very important, uh, as you all can appreciate from an advocacy perspective, uh, to thank our partners in Congress, um, who, uh, who include, I'm, I'm not gonna list them all right now, but foremost among them um, are outgoing Congresswoman Nita Lowy, uh, who's been the chair of the House Appropriations Committee, um, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, who uh, we at the OU have developed a very close relationship with and who heads up the DHS Appropriations Subcommittee in the Senate, um, as well as Ch Senator Chuck Schumer, Rob Portman, and various others. Um, and we really urge you, um, as busy as you're going to be, being focused on the application process and making sure you can utilize these funds to keep your community safe, um, to, uh, to find the time to thank your local members of Congress and, and your senators um, if we get this dramatic uh, expansion of resources as we expect, um, because uh, it, even in the face of current events, it was not a small uh, feat. Um, so uh, as you all know, good advocacy includes thanking, thanking folks um, when, when they uh, grant your requests, not just, not just uh, banging on their door when you're making the request. Um, so uh, again, we, we, we at the OU are very appreciative for our partnership in these efforts with JFNA uh, and with SCN. And uh, thank you for letting me participate in this webinar and I'll turn it over um, to the folks at SCN. Thanks, Nathan. We'll give it a minute to bring up the slide deck and then we'll, uh, we'll jump into the presentation. 
Next slide, please. So, great, thank you. Um, so just, just quickly at the outset, obviously, uh, as, as you heard from everyone, this, this call is very preliminary in nature. Uh, as we've worked very hard to get ahead of the grant cycle year over year and be able to provide as much detail and data from, from the year past, um, it's important to recognize that new guidance for the next fiscal year as it relates to NSGP has not yet been released. Um, as we know, however, we, we have put together this information based on historical data, past cycles, uh, but that being said, it's important to kind of track as information comes up. Uh, many of you have been on Rob's, uh, Rob Goldberg's distribution list for years. Uh, I encourage you, if you have not, to get on that list. We'll provide that information today. Uh, he, he will continue to push out guidance as it comes out. Uh, so as Nathan said, you know, when we're ready to go, uh, we're all ready to go and we have uh, as much lead time uh, on things that we know are going to be in the application or suspect. But at the same time, we're looking at uh, new information that's coming out that might change some requirements for this year, different levels of funding, and anything else that might come into play. I think the most important thing beyond what comes out federally as well, for those of you that are familiar with the process in the past, you'll hear us say um, probably about a dozen times throughout this presentation, State Administrative Agency or SAA, uh, those are the folks at the state level that are the ones that actually administer the grant uh, to the subgrantees, of which all of you would be. And it's important that, that there's open lines of communication with those SAAs because they will ultimately determine uh, certain state level requirements and uh, be able to, to provide the local consult on any, any nuances within dates and timelines that may, may change or, or shift at the local level. So that's an important partner uh, in your efforts. Next slide, please. You heard a little bit about this from, from Rob and Nathan and Alana, but I think it's an important uh, slide to put up both in advocacy uh, that cycle, but recognizing that this is a program that's been around for, for nearly 15 plus years now. Um, but it's also one that uh, we don't take for granted. Uh, in several of the past years, we've seen a steady increase in funding from 25 million to 60 million. Uh, in this past year was 90 million, which is the highest, highest ever. Uh, but it, again, that uh, we expect that number to go up. Uh, we'll have a better idea in the coming weeks. But it's, it's important to just get a snapshot of what that looks like. Traditionally, uh, you know, if you look at the number of applicants versus the number of awardees, you know, in years past, we've seen a 30 to 40% range. This past year was a significant increase in, in award uh, to nearly 52%, which was great for the community. Um, and the significant number of, uh, of grants that were applied for and both uh, awarded in that, uh, in that case last year uh, was the highest. Um, but I think it's, it's good to always just look at this historically and see where the program has, has come, uh, not without a lot of hard work and advocacy, either restoring funding levels, ensuring that they remain, ensuring that the program remains intact, uh, is really a, a true partnership effort amongst all the partners on the phone and other partners who are not on the phone. Uh, so again, uh, important to keep the context and perspective as we, we look at what the funding looks like year over year. Next slide, please. So broadly, what does the program seek to do? For those of you that have, have done this, this is a refresher. For those of you that are new to this, um, you know, as, as the program has become more broad in eligibility with the state edition of the Beyond the UASI program, it's important to just provide some initial overview and guidance. Uh, really in the history in the first dozen years, um, it was strictly related to physical security, uh, again, tied to an authorized equipment list, which we'll cover in further detail later in the presentation. But the goal was really singularly around physical target hardening to close vulnerabilities and gaps uh, within physical security. That's expanded since in the past couple of years to include training, which was a critical ask and advocacy effort to ensure that as part of building out these holistic security programs, we weren't just focusing on some of the equipment, but really training people on the use of that equipment, training people in active threat, active shooter, and other uh, related security uh, and preparedness uh, training, which is critical to that holistic security framework and that, that broader effort. Um, also, you'll, you'll see in, in a couple years past and, and potentially in this program as well, uh, there's been some allowable adjustments for contracted security personnel. Uh, again, that is limited in scope and not the primary purpose of the, of the grant program. Uh, Rob will talk a little bit about that later on the presentation because I think it's important to note some of the issues and concerns with that in the past and some potential pitfalls and, and you know, different mindsets within different states on uh, the scope and, uh, and use of, of the funding for contract security personnel, so it's important. But I think more broadly, as you look at not just facility level, but as we look at the application and talk about some of the requirements and perspective, um, just really be thinking about how your organization fits with a broader community response. 
when we think about you know a whole community approach that FEMA advocates for, and and really strengthening the organization, it's not just about uh, the single facility. It's really about you know the critical role that facility and organization plays in the broader community, related related to that national security framework and the national preparedness goal, which Rob will speak about in a little while. Next slide, please. Related to elig eligibility, um, this one's pretty straightforward. Uh, when we talk about the where, that's that's been a, a change in the past couple of years. And we'll cover that in further detail. The genesis of the program, as as Nathan and, and Michael and Alan articulated, was really looking at the the threat and risk to nonprofits, um, houses of worship, community centers, hospitals related, uh, that really had a, a threat uh, from international terrorist groups at the time. Uh, obviously, uh, things have changed with the threat landscape, and and so is the grant program. So there's been a recognition of a, a broader expanse of risk and threat uh, within that uh, within that space uh, to include violent extremists domestically uh, and other white supremacists and neo-Nazi threats uh, to broaden kind of the aperture. But again, uh, being a 501c3 nonprofit, uh, you know, is 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 a requirement of the eligibility. Uh, traditionally, in the past, the program was limited to what we did, what we call urban area security initiatives. Those are areas uh, within the country that DHS determines to be at high risk of terrorist attack more broadly, and that is determined year over year by a risk-based analysis and approach uh, at DHS. There's been significant advocacy in the past years and, and, and within the last two-year grant cycle, uh, there was success in expanding the program beyond those traditional limited UASI regions to uh, include a NSGPS program. And for the first time, that allowed smaller and more rural areas that, that traditionally did not fall within that urban area, but we know in the Jewish community maintain a significant high level of risk, often a higher risk because the resources are not the same at the local level, but the threat picture may be, uh, really expanded that opportunity for first time applicants. And, and with that, the pool of money uh, expanded as well. Uh, last year, there was 50 million for the UASI region and there was 40 million for the state program, which was a fourfold increase from the, the prior year, uh, which was the first year of inception for that component of the program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a snapshot, as I mentioned, UASI regions on the last slide. Uh, again, subject to change year over year, UASI is based on an annual DHS risk-based process I mentioned. Um, and we can we expect that continued eligibility for not just the UASI areas, but other orgs outside that region within the state program. Um, it's important to look at this as we go into the, the grant funding cycle. Uh, again, disclaimer and just call your attention, this is for 2020, the past year. Uh, the OASI regions will be included and announced as part of the uh, the program um, in the, the NOFO that will come out in, in the coming weeks. Uh, but it's important to, one, look to see if the OASI regions have changed. In the past, we've seen New Orleans come on and off. Las Vegas has been off one, one year, it's on now, as far as, as well as Cleveland and some other places. So it's really important just to determine uh, where you sit in the landscape of the UASI program or the NSGPS program, because it will determine which program you need to apply for. And, and Rob will cover that in further detail, um, you know, next set of slides. Next slide, please. Rob. I promised myself I wouldn't do that. Uh, the NSGP program is one of a complement of national grants that support the nation's collective responsibility to prepare and secure the country from foreign and domestic terrorist threats. The investments supported through the NSGP are intended to help build a safe and resilient nation by achieving one or more of the following capabilities. As we discuss later in the impact section of the PowerPoint, a sub-applicant will be required to identify at least one of these capabilities that will, will be built or achieved through their project. This information will be assessed by FEMA to predict or measure the efficacy and likelihood of success of the project request. Failing to clearly identify the applicable capabilities will negatively impact a sub-applicant score. Next slide, please. In addition to determining the funding level, Congress will also determine how it will allocate the funding between the two prongs of the program. My expectation is that the funding will be allocated fairly evenly this year between both the urban uh, area and state programs. Once the funding is sent to FEMA, FEMA will determine which urban areas will be eligible to participate in the urban area program. Only out at the end of the award process will, participate, will participating urban areas learn how FEMA parsed funding between the jurisdictions 
based on internal assessment of risks. However, FEMA will set the funding allocations each state will receive under the state initiative at the beginning in the notice of funding opportunity. FEMA has established a three-year period of performance, although most projects are generally completed within the first or second years. Additionally, the state or federal reviewers may prefer projects with shorter completion times as they will be scoring the efficiency and efficacy of each program. As we discussed later in the PowerPoint, sub-applicants will set forth their estimated program implementation timelines in the project milestone section of the application. Following general federal grant practices, the NSGP awards are paid out through a reimbursement format as a precaution against misuse of funds. The subgrantees are required to lay out the funding for the approved project investments and activities and submit reimbursement requests that substantiate the outlays to the state administration agency. Only permissible uses of the funds that are included in the application and are approved in the ward notification can be reimbursed. For this year, we expect that the notice of funding opportunity will be announced about 60 days after Congress approves the funding. When that occurs, the state administrative agencies will have between 45 and 60 days to receive, score, and submit sub-grant applications to FEMA. Within this time frame, the SAAs will establish the grant period to receive subgrant applications, which can vary by jurisdiction. Generally speaking, we expect nonprofits will have about 30 days to complete and submit their applications to the SAAs. FEMA will also set the funding caps in the notice of funding opportunity. The current cap is 100,000 for both the urban area and state programs. Although the SAAs, especially under the state program, may set a lower cap in their jurisdictions to increase the total number of applicants they recommend for funding across the state. If FEMA receives an increase in funding this year, which we expect, they may elect to increase the cap for one or more, one or both of the programs. By law, awards must be announced uh, by the Department of Homeland Security by midnight on September 30th. Uh, but those announcements typically happen between mid-August and early September. Next slide. As previously mentioned, the program can support several categories of permissible costs, including physical target hardening, emergency preparedness planning and training and exercises, and the hiring of contracted security personnel. However, the lion's share of the grant supports physical target hardening, consistent with FEMA's position that the program's primary intent is to save lives and protect property. Target hardening under the program is limited to two categories of physical security equipment and inspection and screening systems set forth in FEMA's approved equipment list or AEL. Examples of approved equipment include gates, fences and bollards, lighting systems, access control systems, video camera and surveillance systems, reinforced locks, windows and doors and more. I warn that navigating the online AEL portal can be a bit challenging and take some patience. Uh, we do walk through navigating the portal in our written guidance, uh, which is available to everyone on this call uh, upon request. When we review section three and four of the investment justification, we will address in greater detail what target hardening entails, as well as the types of training, planning, and exercises that can be utilized under the grant. Next slide. All permissible costs to be considered for funding using the NSGP must be included in the sub-applicant's investment justification or IJ. If it is not included in the IJ, equipment or activity, activities normally permissible will be disqualified for funding. Additionally, pre-award costs are generally not allowed, such as security investments made prior to an award or costs associated with conducting the risk assessment or in completing the investment justification. Next slide. Thanks, Rob. So we covered this in a little bit of uh, kind of generally, but I think it's 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 so critically important that we uh, you know kind of cover it again. And, and really, the one item on this slide I really want to point out is that is that first step bullet. Um, as, as, as we mentioned, you know, 2018 was the first time that this program, uh, the second component of the program beyond the UASI uh, limited scope was, was introduced with the nonprofit security 
uh, state level program, um, NSGPS, we call it. Um, as I mentioned, once that UASI list is released for the upcoming year, it, it's critically important that we, we, we check both against the list, but also if there's questions with the SAA on, on where we reside within those, those opportunity zones. Um, for many of you, uh, this is not new. Many of you, it's straightforward, but it does get a little tricky on some of the fringes of the UASI regions to include some of the, uh, what FEMA has determined and, and called Metropolitan Statistical Areas, MSAs, or I'm sorry, yeah, areas, which you know may be contiguous or, or next to UASI region. So it does get a little sticky on some of those borders. Um, many of you, if you are you know, a, a past grant recipient in South Jersey, know that sometimes those UASI regions can cross state lines as well. So it's important to one, identify your proper SAA, they might be in another adjoining state, or at the same time, determine where you sit within the UASI region or, or another area outside of the UASI region to determine whether you're applying to the NSGP UA, UASI, urban area, or the NSGP S program. Next slide. So the evaluation criteria apply to both urban area and state initiatives. The application is structured to assess how well a sub applicant meets these requirements. Our written guidance was developed to help satisfy the criteria. For scoring purposes, as we describe later, it is paramount that all sub applicants make clear that due to their ideology, beliefs, and mission, they are at a high risk of a terrorist attack. If the sub applicant does not make this case, it will be hard for them to earn enough points to secure a grant award. Additionally, Sub-applicants will be evaluated to make sure they have made the correct designation for applying to the correct program initiative, which is based on the sub-applicant's physical address, and whether they have previously received NSGB funding in a prior year. We expect that FEMA will continue to apply a certain level of bonus points, most recently five points, to the final scores of organizations that have not previously received an NSC, NSGP grant award. Next slide. To be clear, the state is the applicant and the nonprofit is the sub-applicant. When FEMA releases its notice of funding opportunity for the program, they are releasing it to the state's designated Homeland Security Emergency Management Agency, refer referred to in the NOFO as the State Administrative Agency or SAA. The SAAs are responsible for applying for the grants on behalf of the nonprofit sub-applicant. The sub-applicants will look to their SAAs for all official guidance, instructions, and application materials required of FEMA and the state. They are the sub-applicants' point of contact. In nearly all circumstances, there would be no reason for a nonprofit to engage FEMA directly. That would be a red flag uh, that the nonprofit is not following directions. It should be noted that, that the SAAs may operate their NSGP program somewhat differently from state to state, as FEMA guidelines provide the SAAs with a degree of latitude and discretion in how they proceed. As such, while JFNA, SCAN, the OU, and others will assist applicants based on the overarching FEMA provided guidance, the SAA's interpretation and application of the guidance is what matters most to the sub applicants in their jurisdictions. For example, while not, while not in FEMA's guidance, some states may require pre-qualification to do business with the state or require sub-applicants to register with the federal contracting system for award management. While not major hurdles to qualify, they must be satisfied and may take time to complete. Under these circumstances, all sub-applicants should carefully review the instructions and requirements posted or provided by their SAA and to rely utmost on the state guidance or any additional details or requirements provided by the SAA. And I note that sometimes the SAAs do make mistakes in processing FEMA guidance, and we can be a resource to sub-applicants in those circumstances to facilitate a clarification or remedy from FEMA. Next slide. The application is called an investment or IJ, as I've mentioned. There are seven parts to the investment justification which we will review in order. Some, but not all of the sections have character limitations and most, but not all of the sections will be scored. However, completeness is paramount, paramount as even sections that are not scored specifically will still be evaluated and the quality and completeness of all responses will impact the final score. 
Consequently, all sections should be treated with the same level of importance uh, and care and none should be taken for granted. Next slide. The applicant information section focuses on the sub applicants general demographics. This seems innocuous enough, but this is not the case. First of all, how a sub applicant responds to the question on organizational type can make the difference between securing a grant or not. In answering this question, it is imperative the sub applicant make the connection to the organization's Jewish faith, values, learning, heritage, and way of life. Additionally, each nonprofit is required to submit a mission statement along with the IJ, and the mission statement should also reflect the organization's Jewish identity and connection to the Jewish community and way of life. As you draft your responses, always be thinking about how to articulate how the organization's ideology, beliefs, and mission make them a high risk of a terrorist attack. Also, as mentioned, the physical address question will determine whether the sub-applicant applies under the urban area or state initiatives. A mistake here could also lead to disqualification. With respect to providing a 501c3 number or EIN, certain organizations such as churches, mosques, and synagogues are automatically exempt and are not required to provide recognition of exemption. They would leave the EIN number blank. However, some SAAs may require exempt organizations to submit an affidavit or other statement affirming tax exempt status. Next slide. There are two parts to the background section. In the first part, the sub applicant should make the case that the type of organization is, it is and its role and place in the community make it a likely target of a threat. This could be exemplified by its membership, its mission statement, services offered, population served, curriculum, programs or services offered, or its symbolic value in the community. For example, for more than 100 years, Federation X continues to be recognized in the community as the central body for raising funds, helping to coordinate programs and services to strengthen Jewish life, experience and meaning, and providing a safety net for the most vulnerable in their community. In the second part, the sub applicant must explain any role it has in responding to or recovering from a terrorist attack. Many sub applicants struggle to answer this part because they do not see themselves in a responder role. An example of how to respond. Federation X is a member of JVOAD, or Jewish Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster, and raises funds to respond to man-made and natural disasters such as providing relief from hurricanes, fires, and earthquakes, and responding to devastating attacks as it did after the 9-11, Tree of Life, Poe, Jersey City, and Muncie massacres. Often in a crisis, Federation X opens its doors and services to first responders, serving them as a central meeting, port, uh, meeting point and providing them with respite care they need to successfully do their jobs. Uh, again, our written guidance provides recommendations on how to respond to these questions. Next slide. Why we feel the exact, why we all feel the existential threat, NSGP is a risk-based program. In making decisions, the determination of risk is a central factor in how the SAAs and FEMA will rank and prioritize the applications they review. Therefore, each sub-applicant is required to conduct a vulnerability risk assessment which serves as a framework for them to identify risks and weaknesses and to determine and prioritize the resources they seek through the grant to address their most critical security needs. The risk section of the IJ has three parts. Uh, to, first part, to address the specific or relative threats to the sub-applicant. Second part, to identify the vulnerabilities or weaknesses in their physical security or the gaps in emergency preparedness planning, planning or training they need. And thirdly, to describe the consequences or impact a terrorist threat would have on the sub applicant, its staff, volunteers, constituents, and community. A good vulnerability risk assessment will identify any specific record or threat or general but relevant threat occurrence that relate to the sub applicant and will spell out the specific protective measures required and recommended, whether target hardening, planning, training exercises, or contracted security personnel that would most efficiently and effectively counter the risks, 
minimize the vulnerabilities and mitigate the potential consequences of a, an attack. A quality vulnerability risk assessment will also help to identify and satisfy key measurements of success in the impact section of the IJ as we discuss later. Whatever the quality of the vulnerability risk assessment is, the sub-applicant must address these questions as best they can, and the materials we provide are intended to help in that way. We delve further into the vulnerability risk assessment in subsequent slides. Next. Thanks, Rob. So Rob, Rob touched a little bit on the vulnerability and risk assessment. Uh, it is a critical and required step of the process as it really establishes what that baseline looks like as it relates to, to gaps uh, and vulnerabilities within an organization. And really the most important part of that is that it needs to inform your investment justification. Um, you know, we recommend at SCN to work through a variety of, of options in doing that. Uh, the reason why we start early and, and always uh, remind folks that this is a year-round process is risk and vulnerability assessments typically done with, within a year, uh, even though there's not hard and fast guidance on this. Um, you know, it doesn't need to be done the month before, two months before. So we recommend getting them done as soon as possible. Um, but really uh, leveraging some of those professional resources that you have within the federation space. If there's community security director or regional security advisors through SCN, uh, in addition to local law enforcement, other, other trusted partners uh, and professionals uh, that can assist you in completing a professional assessment, uh, obviously that'll help you uh, in the long run of informing that investment justification and determine where your gaps are uh, and subsequently where those investments should be made. Uh, additionally, um, SCN can, can be supportive in that effort in a limited capacity. Obviously, COVID has made it challenged to do physical assessments this year, uh, but there's a variety of ways that we can talk and walk through with, uh, with our partners to help in that regard. And then lastly, uh, in years past, uh, we have developed a self-assessment tool uh, that provides similar guidance that we provide a professional group. Uh, that is simple and user friendly and organizations can use internally, either facility or, uh, you know, other folks with some level of, of expertise within a facility, not necessarily security background, uh, but really be able to do that self assessment internally uh, and identify some of those some of those risks as it relates to the facility. Uh, or vulnerabilities internally or externally uh, around the facility, uh, we will be updating and releasing that tool in the coming weeks. Uh, and we'll ensure as the recording and, and subsequent guiding goes out to the group on, on this webinar today that we will follow up uh, and, and push that tool out as well. Next slide, please. So Rob talked about target hardening throughout the, the application process and investment justification. And target hardening is kind of a broad term that, that has historically covered four areas. Uh, and I'm gonna talk through each of them a, a little bit. Physical security improvements, which we'll cover on this slide, planning, training, and then exercises. Uh, largely, uh, the primary and original goal of the program, as we discussed earlier, was really to harden facilities with protective or physical security equipment where those gaps may have been. Um, really something, as, as Michael mentioned it before, and Rob gave a list of some of, the, some of the inclusions on the AEL, we'll talk through a couple more, but it can be simple, it's something as simple as a reinforced door, which we saw repelled in the attacker in Holly, Germany, or something more advanced in a larger facility that includes advanced access control or intrusion detection systems. Again, based on the gap that you may have and, and, and based on the findings of your vulnerability assessment. Uh, and any physical security equipment really needs to kind of address those two components. Number one, again, being addressing and mitigating or correcting that vulnerability identified in that assessment. And two, um, ensuring that it is uh, equipment that is recognized and authorized on that FEMA AEL, uh, which is accessible through FEMA's, uh, FEMA's website. Uh, as Rob mentioned, that is the list of approved equipment broadly across FEMA uh, grant programs, not just specific to NHGP, uh, but it really has a, a broad 21 equipment category. Uh, it does take a little navigation, but uh, if you are actually looking at it from the CSV side of things, there is an ability to do kind of that, that traditional control F and search and really help you narrow down uh, what you're looking for when it relates to you know, cameras or, or screening equipment. When it comes to communications, I do want to point out one thing. There are nuances uh, in type. So there are descriptions included in the equipment list, which is important to recognize. Some types of, of notification platforms or systems are allowable, others are not. So it is important that one, you study that list and two, if there are questions that cannot be discerned or determined through that uh, review of the AEL, 
that that is a question that is brought to the SAA or or Rob or, or one of the other experts that have uh, you know may have some some additional guidance. Next slide, please. So planning uh, is is a critical component of of any security plan or an operation, as you all know. Planning in this context is is important and was an add on as it relates to allowable use of funds in in the past couple of years. Uh, anything to do with preparedness planning internally, uh, development of those security plans and protocols, uh, emergency action plans, emergency operations plans, EOPs as we call them. Uh, so there, there can be, in addition to your target hardening and vulnerability assessment, if there are missing policies, procedures, or SOPs you wish to develop as part of your broader comprehensive security plan and strategy, uh, there can be carve-outs and, and written narrative components to that as allowable expenditures uh, under the grant program. Next slide, please. Uh, training, uh, again, a handful of years ago, training was after several rounds of advocacy uh, was another allowable component introduced into, uh, into funding. Uh, training was typically limited to physical security equipment and hardware, you know, how to use certain things, how to deploy certain uh, uh, equipment in your facility, but it really has expanded to include a lot of the, the broader components of, of preparedness, active threat, active shooter training, uh, stop the bleed, CERT, community emergency response team training, so there is, there is a range of training that is allowable, and we'll talk about exercises a little different than training, but nonetheless important in a subsequent slide. Uh, but as you think through a broader ask of the program and needs within your own facility, uh, it is important to be well-rounded, not just limited to capital expenditures related to physical security equipment, but really looking at some of those planning preparedness and training uh, processes uh, and investments in, in your own people as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just not a not a comprehensive, inclusive list, but some of the training that SCN currently, uh, you know, provides to our, our partners. Anything from situation awareness to greeter usher, our new countering active threat training, which is our advanced active shooter active threat uh, response training, which has been made available to all of our security directors uh, in federations across the country, uh, and that Brad and the rest of the training team uh, train uh, multiple times. Uh, uh, during the week um, and can be made available. Um, the other component that too, we often get a lot of questions about the cost of training. And while it ranges depending on, on vendors that you use and provide, as we've moved toward a collective standardized approach to training within our, our federations, within our JCCs, uh, through our, our synagogue partners nationally, the countering active threat and other, other training that's, that's really been built on best practice informed by some of our work with federal law enforcement um, you know, is training that we can we can help assist with. And as people think through what the costs are, SCN has developed a, a broad services guide, really just to make a, a good estimate on market value of some of this. Uh, many of you may do this with local uh, local estimates, local solutions providers, integrators, or working with law enforcement. But if there is a need or request for, for cost of training or estimated cost of training as you're putting together your investment justification and application, you know, please do reach out to us and we can be helpful in uh, putting together some of those cost proposals and, and working that into, uh, into your grant application. Next slide, please. Lastly, on exercises, um, you know, kind of in that evolution of, of training um, experience, looking at the ability to do either tabletop exercises, you know, simulated exercises, full-scale exercises. Uh, we've worked with a lot of federations and other organizations in the past several years that have really graduated uh, and escalated their level of training to include full-scale exercises. Uh, our partners at the Federation in Cleveland, uh, the JCC in Memphis, and other programs uh, where funding can be, can be used to do multi-jurisdictional, multi-organizational training and exercises uh, so we do encourage you, if there's interest in this, um, happy to assist with, with providing some of that guidance on what that, what, could, what that could look like. But beyond your own applications, just food for thought and consideration, a lot of times there are broader preparedness grants uh, within your communities that law enforcement and public safety partners may already have applied for. Uh, so as we always recommend working with local law enforcement on a variety of safety and security issues, it's important to consult with them locally uh, to understand the opportunities that may exist, funding that they may have, and really leverage some of that other government funding outside of this specific program to engage in joint training and exercises, uh, which, which at the end of the day benefits everyone. Next slide, please. 
So the ability to contract security personnel or off-duty police is a relatively new permissible cost. The funding may not be used to underwrite existing security contracts. It may not be used to purchase equipment for contracted security personnel. The guidance in FY 2020 required that sub applicants submit a plan that explains how contracted security personnel costs will be sustained after the funding or period of performance of the award expires, suggesting that in the absence of a sustainment plan or capabilities, this may not be considered by the SAA to be a good investment of limited resources for a particular applicant. We expect that contracted security personnel will be a continued eligible cost this year, but I note that this is not a typically funded investment under the FEMA Emergency Preparedness Grant Programs. It is possible that FEMA could further tighten the requirements for contracted security personnel in the next NOFO. Um, so I strongly suggest that anyone interested in pursuing the investment should seek specific guidance from their SAAs uh, on point once the NOFO has been published. Next slide. The project milestone questions go to competency. The SAAs and FEMA want to have confidence in the sub-applicants understanding of the scope and nature of their project and that the project can be completed within the 36 month period of performance. Milestones may include the hiring of vendors, ordering, acquiring and installing equipment, planning, scheduling and carrying out of training, submitting FEMA required administrative paperwork and so forth. As I mentioned previously, a long and drawn out process that sets forth unusual, incomplete, or unrealistic details, timelines, or outco outcomes may raise red flags and loose points during the review process. I note our written guidance provides a sample sequence of possible milestones that program uh, from program start to finish for sub applicants to draw inspiration from. Next slide. The project management section also serves as a confidence builder in the review process. It shows that the sub applicant has a management plan worked out, has assigned responsibilities to competent people, has thought through the process and identified any potential challenges it might have to address or resolve during project implementation. The section also importantly provides an opportunity for the sub applicant to highlight how the grant opportunity will promote coordination and collaboration with state and local law enforcement or other public partners, such as first responders or hospitals. By way of illustration, a sub applicant may have a local law enforcement conduct the sub applicant's vulnerability risk assessment, have local law enforcement lead or participate in preparedness training or tabletop exercises, provide some role for local law enforcement in program review particularly with respect to the investments they may have recommended in the assessment, or invite law enforcement to make suggestions on how they might engage the organization going forward and incorporate those suggestions into its management plans. No matter what, it is highly recommended that the sub applicants figure out a way to integrate law enforcement first responder assets into the framework of project planning and management as well as possible activities or opportunities to build a lasting relationship with them. Uh, and that should be articulated in this section of the IJ. Next slide. The grant is highly competitive. Therefore, a sub applicant should never leave an, an open question. Partial answers are better than no answers. And our written guidance is intended to help prompt answers, rather prompt drafting answers. Additionally, sub applicants must be especially careful to answer the questions in the sections where they are asked. The right answer placed in the wrong session, section will earn zero points. Also, while there's a maximum raw score of 40 points that can be earned, the final score will be calculated by additional factors, including the sub applicants organizational type and whether they have previously received a grant. For example, a day school applicant that illustrates that it is at high risk of a terrorist attack due to its ideology, beliefs, and mission will have its raw score multiplied by a factor of three, tripling its final score. Whereas a day school that simply describes itself as an educational institution could have its raw score multiplied by a factor of two, only doubling its final score. By way of illustration, 
As we know, a Jewish day school is not simply a school. It may include religious services and Jewish learning. It may be pro-Israel. It may fly the Israeli flag alongside the American flag. Its mission may state it is pro-Zionist. The school's name and signage may identif identify it as Jewish. It may open its doors to the community to host Jewish holidays or cultural events. These characteristics make a school at high risk for terrorist attack because of its ideology, beliefs, and mission. Each sub-applicant must do its best to make this point uh, uh, based on its own particular circumstances. Additionally, with high demand and limited resources, we expect FEMA will continue its practice of adding some level of bonus points to the final score for organizations that have never previously received a grant. Last year, that um, uh, the point system was based on uh, five additional points. Next slide. Thanks, Rob. Uh, just a couple couple of slides to, uh, before we, we turn over to Howie to talk about some state level opportunities. Um, not going to go through this uh, pre application checklist slide in detail. It is really designed and developed to be a takeaway and really, uh, you know, exactly to its name, a checklist for kind of walking through, um, you know, things that can be done now, should be done now. As, as Michael mentioned at the start of this, we started early, as should you. There's several things that many of you may have already done, but I think most importantly, as we kind of look through this list, I'm going to pick a few out. It's really determining who needs to be part of this process, uh, whether it's folks from finance, facilities, um, you know, law enforcement partners. It really is a team effort to be successful, not just in the grant application, but in the in the, the planning and pre So I think it's important that uh, many of these things are done now if they've not already been done and work through that list um, you know, in somewhat of a se sequential order. Uh, as, uh, as Rob has mentioned, there's uh, the, the 2020 investment justification, uh, you know, as part of his guidance. So you can get a head start on looking at that. I know that was one of the questions prior. Uh, there is, is some change year over year, but largely those sections remain. Uh, so there can be narrative work, there can be risk work, uh, that, that can be done uh, for those sections. Rob, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I think I, I may have uh, skipped the impact slide uh, in my eagerness to move quickly. Can we get back to that? Because this is very important and I'll run through it quickly. So in the impact section, the sub-applicant is required to address two questions. First, they are asked to explain the expected measurable outputs and outcomes resulting from the completion of the project that will best illustrate the success of the project. Here, the response should include a self-assessment statement and how in practice the target hardening investments required through the grant as set forth in part four of the IJ most efficiently and effectively reduce the risks and vulnerabilities identified in the risk section of the application part three and thus protect against the consequences of potential terrorist attack. Second, and this is really important, uh, applicants are asked to, to describe the security and resiliency improvements that they will uh, achieve through the grant. This section will help FEMA assess the contributions the sub-applicant will make to the nation's collective national preparedness goals through the proposed project. To do this, sub-applicants are required to describe how specific project investments build or achieve one or more of FEMA's designated core capabilities. Core capabilities fall under one of five mission areas, prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. By way of example of achieving a prevention capability, the vulnerability risk assessment found that the day school was vulnerable to an intruder because it has multiple unsecured entry points and no access controls. It is vulnerable to an intrusion that would place the lives of the students, faculty, and visitors at risk of an actor, active shooter incident. Other schools have previously been targeted by active shooters. This could lead to multiple casualties, including loss of life. If it is possible that the school would not be able to recover and remain open to serve the community if such an incident were to occur. Through the acquisition and the installation of an access control system and creating a single point of entry through the grant, the school will be able to prevent a possible active shooter attack. This is uh, another section where sub-applicants lose points because they get confused by the core capabilities concept. Uh, further explanation and illustrations of answering uh, this section is found in our written guidance as well. And with that, I pass it back to Pat. 
Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So just to wrap uh, before we, we turn over to Howie, um, you know, following, following Rob's uh, description of really a sound project management plan and a, and a project team uh, with capability to manage the project, uh, you know, a couple other considerations. Um, you know, when you're looking at your vulnerability assessment, you're looking at priorities, uh, really need to consider the complexity of a project. Well, there is a three-year period of performance for this grant. Um, that needs to also take in some of the things that we don't traditionally think of. Uh, by one example, we just, you know, worked with the camp this past year that actually, you know, after three years, had they were successful in, in, in winning an award, but they were uh, required to return funds because they could not get through long processes of, of federal conservation easements and other components of adjacent land and, and part of that planning project. So it's critically important to think through complexities of project to ensure uh, that you have enough time and runway to plan for them, execute them, um, and, and consider what that might look like. Also thinking through some of the long-term maintenance, sustainment and replacement costs, um, not that this should necessarily make or break a selection uh, based on a critical gap in, in vulnerability, uh, but just as part of consideration to really be able to articulate what that plan looks like and understanding what some of those costs, those hidden costs, costs of ownership, as they say, um, you know, maybe as part of that process. Um, and then again, well, you know, in, in past years we've seen uh, seen allocations of individual awards be, you know, $100,000, uh, you know, $150,000, you know, less some years. Um, that money may not go as far as you think when you're looking at a, a sophisticated access control or CCTV system that could be $50,000, $70,000 in investments. So it is important to prioritize uh, with all, all of those kind of components and thought processes in place from complexity to uh, installation to really ensuring that we're closing as many gaps identified in that assessment process as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll leave this up for, for a moment. Uh, several of you had asked uh, how to get on Rob's distribution list. His email is there. Uh, the best way to reach him is to email him and, and get on that list. Um, I do wanna, before we go to moderated Q&A, um, one, I want to thank my team for answering 22, 23 questions already throughout the presentation. We do have another 35. Obviously, we will not get through all of them. What we traditionally do uh, is work through them in collective, kind of group them, and we will issue uh, as best of a written response to some of them as we come in, in coming days. Uh, but we will continue to host these sessions uh, in, into January and February, as Michael articulated at the top of the presentation. So uh, we will be accessible and ensure that uh, we answer as many questions along uh, as possible. Um, I want to turn the, uh, the the mic over to Patrick. Can I just mention one thing? To the yes. I saw I saw sorry to interrupt. Just I saw there were a number of questions asking about resources to help with the grants. Um, I know SCN has resources. Um, and I just want to make folks aware that at the OU, uh, we have staff and we also for this process have uh, experienced grant consultants on retainer uh, who are available to help uh, individual institutions with the grant process. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll make our, the contact information available to that, uh, for that, for those who are interested uh, through, uh, through the SCN team. To those who are interested. Thank you, Nathan. Appreciate that. Um, Want to turn it over to uh, to uh, a good friend and colleague, uh, Howie Beagleman, the executive director of Ohio Jewish Communities. Uh, I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with Howie for over a decade now, similar to Rob in, in the nonprofit grant space and other related areas. Um, Want to give Howie an opportunity to talk a little bit about the the state advocacy work, uh, strictly related to homeland security grants and. Many of you had some questions of, of other grants outside of the NSGP. So how, if you can spend a few minutes talking about some of your insight and experience on state level programs uh, and what that looks like, um, you know, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I think that, um, you know, as was mentioned, I think um, before, you know, not, um, not, all, not all places end up being on um, the, um, the UASI list and a big shout out to Rob, Portman, Senator Portman in Ohio, who helped do that for us here, help move us to that. Um, but um, what we found out is what basically we, we want to mimic some of the UIC uh, FEMA funding in, in Ohio itself. Um, and if you'll see, um, there's um, 
we've had in the past couple of years, we've done about four years of, of funding. It's gone everything from um, target hardening and personnel as well uh, to much smaller grants on some training resources and, um, and things like that. And uh, we've had about uh, 195 grants in the past couple of years, uh, totaling for the Jewish community. It's 195 grants in Ohio um, to about 86 different Jewish agencies. And it, it, um, it ends up being about um, $14 million um, in state funding overall, um, a little bit less than state, a little less than state and, and then some federal, but the, 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 the large majority of that is actually uh, state funding. And um, the, 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 the FEMA funding, again, is, is under the NFGPS, the new, the, the new tier. Um, but we went back to the state initially when we were not getting any funding um, really or much funding at all from on the federal side and the state created a, a very similar program initially to, um, to the UASI program. And again, that was for target hardening for any, any nonprofit in Ohio at risk of terrorist attack. Uh, so Jewish, not Jewish. Um, I always tell people it's, it's, it's cause-based nonprofits, it's religious-based nonprofits. So it could be um, obviously a synagogue, a mosque. It could be um, obviously Planned Parenthood and it could be the NRA. It doesn't really matter as long as you're a, you're, you're a nonprofit and you are at risk of terror attack, um, you can apply and you have to showcase that obviously in the application. Um, later on, we added um, personnel to that. So um, a lot of our synagogues and schools and, and JCCs now have um, security personnel paid for by the state, um, at least in part. And um, we also worked with um, legislation that was moving and probably were moving already in, 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 the, in the state um, around school resource officer training. Those are much smaller um, dollar amounts. Those are you know a couple thousand dollar grants at most. And um, we also then have worked with actually the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, believe it or not, was doing safety grants. And we work with them to create some grants around, um, around physical safety. Um, and we had a number of our agencies go in, one of our schools went in and actually got a whole bunch of um, that, um, the tape that goes in the windows to, to protect it from shattering, shattering tape um, from, from BWC. So it's, um, I would really urge people to kind of look at the state as, as a good option and both for the FEMA related grants, obviously, but also for the state side, knowing your SAA, knowing, knowing the, the Department of Public Safety here in Ohio or whatever else it is in, in your state that runs those programs is, is, is critically important. Um, and um, I have some stuff I could share with people afterwards, but in terms of, you know, a breakdown of, you know, what got grants and who got grants and, and when, but it's really, I will tell you for Ohio, we've got tiny communities, you know, Canton is a few hundred Jews, Cleveland's many, many thousands of Jews and many, many, many agencies. Um, every single one of our, our, our communities has gotten a grant, um, at least one grant, and everyone has gotten at least one grant, you know, close to the, the, to the maximum amount. Um, and they've also, um, we've also gotten, even this year alone, we had many, many first time applicants. Um, and I saw a lot of questions in the chat around, you know, what happens if we were turned down last year? We've had folks who were turned down two or three times um, actually in the past. And then we work with them on, on again, some, some, some messaging, some language that, that Rob and Pat went through on how to answer certain things. And um, they, they, they eventually did get um, a grant and, and a pr pretty large one. So um, I would, again, I would just, I'm happy to, I'll shoot from my email and afterwards into the chat. I'm happy to follow anybody afterwards, but I really would urge, if, you, if your state's not doing this, I would really urge you to, to get on them to, to do this. Thanks, Howie. Um, so we have about five minutes left. Uh, so as I mentioned, the team's been answering, uh, answering questions all along. We're gonna open up and have a bit of a panel uh, Q and A here. So I'm gonna do my best to, to group like questions together because we do have uh, several dozen. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll respond to some of these in written form uh, just because we won't have the time. But you know, first question I will pose and leave it to you know any of our team to answer uh, is kind of about the, the threat assessments or the risk assessments. So a uh, two part question to, uh, to couple a, a few together. Um, we recognize there's no kind of standard for one, but how long generally would you say in a risk assessment or a vulnerability assessment is good for? And also if we've made modifications to a facility, either from a grant or other, um, other work done, should we redo that assessment? 
Um, quickly, uh, any assessment that's over three years old should be redone or updated. Any assessment that's three years or newer would suffice for this. Just remember that uh, everything that you're applying for um, has to have as its basis um, a vulnerability or something identified in the risk assessment itself. So if it's not in there in your previous risk assessment, you would wanna make sure that you update it so that whatever you're thinking about in terms of investing in for this go around uh, is reflected in the, investment, in the risk assessment. Thanks, Rob. Uh, next uh, kind of grouping of questions relates to some, some previously awarded. Uh, you know, one of the questions related to having won multiple times, does that decrease, increase, or affect our chance, broadly speaking? Second question related to that, um, can you talk a little bit more, Rob, I know you covered the presentation, but just as a refresher, um, you know, within the application, what does that mean uh, for those that, that previously were, were given an award? Sure. Um, basically, a lot of people think of the, the bonus system as somehow a demerit for those that have uh, applied previously, and it really is not the case. Um, it really is, uh, serves FEMA's purpose of trying to make sure that the, the grant opportunity uh, is spread out for vulnerable organizations across the country. With that said, I know organizations that have received the grant 11 out of 13 times they have applied. Uh, and I've known many that have received multiple grants over time. Uh, so uh, for those that still have unmet needs, it, it behooves them to, to apply again, if they have a need. Uh, unfortunately, with the program, the funding levels uh, for many years uh, were, were super tight. So there just wasn't that many resources uh, to provide uh, uh, applicants who have applied previously and have secured previously. But we are in that window where uh, we've secured significant ad additional dollars in the last three cycles and expect to do so again this cycle by way of example, um, two years ago, uh, when the program was funded at, at $60 million, there were about um, uh, 700 or, or, well, I'll do it differently, the ratio. Two years ago, about a third of applicants that applied were funded. Last year at $90 million, that uh, ratio uh, uh, was more like 50%. So, uh, the dollars impact uh, considerably whether or not uh, an otherwise, you know, um, a good grant application gets funded or not. And I'm pretty sure we'll have good funding this year. Uh, so I got a little off track there, but the point is, is that if you have needs, uh, you should apply. Uh, next question kind of category topic relates to EINs and 501c3s. Can you just provide a little clarification whether or not uh, somebody needs to or should leave the EIN blank if they are a 501c3. Um, are, I, you mentioned automatic exemption for a 501c3, not necessarily needing to provide anything beyond that, but can you just talk a little bit about some of those parameters again, Rob? Sure, so, so go ahead, Nathan. Or Nathan, sorry. Yeah, just what, what this relates to is something not about this program in particular. It, if you are a synagogue or a church uh, or other, another kind of house of worship, whoever you might be in our community. Uh, houses of worship do not have to formally file with the IRS to get 501c3 tax exempt status. They are automatically deemed to have that status. So mo most do, it makes it easier for a whole variety of tax and charitable contribution purposes. But if you happen to be a synagogue or a church or a mosque that did not go through the 501c3 process, um, you can still fill out this application, even though, right, an absolute essential criteria is that you be a 501c3 institution to receive such a grant, because the government will say, oh, you're a synagogue, it doesn't matter that you didn't file officially, you're a 501c3. If you're not a synagogue or a church or some other house of worship, you need to have gone through, and I'm sure you all have, uh, if you're not a house of worship, and have 501c3 status. The only, the only thing I'll add to that is, again, uh, FEMA doesn't require anything of a uh, house of worship, but the state administrative agency may require uh, a house of worship to submit, you know, uh, either just a, a, a paper stating that they are a house of worship and therefore 
or tax exempt. Uh, and that statement may require, you know, um, you know, a formal signature of some some fashion. But but that's it. That's about it in terms. So it's really, if you're a house of worship, you would want to make sure you read through your state emergency or your state administrative agency's requirements to see if you need to submit a piece of paper that's that states your status. Thanks, Rob. Uh, we're just at about time. Uh, I recognize there's there's a number of questions in the chat. Uh, as in years past, we will we will commit to you. We will work through those. Uh, we have a running FAQ doc. Uh, chances are many questions have been asked before, answers provided, uh, but we will add to that over the coming days. And when we push out the recording uh, that is inclusive of the slide deck and all the comments made today, uh, we will work to include that. Um, I just want to thank uh, all of our presenters and partners today. Uh, the OU, Ohio Jewish Communities, JFNA, and certainly my colleagues at SCN uh, for joining us. As we mentioned, this is the first in the series. Uh, we will continue to uh, cover these closer into, uh, you know, grant season in January when we'll have additional guidance. In the interim, please ensure uh, that you stay close to um, any information coming out to include from OU, from JFNA, and other sources. Uh, as that information will be valuable to help your planning process going into the future. So uh, again, thanks for joining us and uh, be well and stay safe.